Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of your plan of redemption uh, laid out for us to marvel at. Uh, We ask that you would bless our time together as we read and consider your word uh, and as we take uh, our morning tithes and offerings that you would bless them to the the use and to the building of your kingdom here in uh, James Bay and beyond. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I am uh, interrupting your series in Jonah. Jonah is an exotic book, uh, a fun book to read um, and and, uh, to look at. So you jump suddenly into the middle of 1 Samuel for a week. And so let me give you just a little bit of background. We are in the place in the story of the history of the people of, of Israel where their first king, Saul has been appointed, and Saul has, has shown himself to be a, uh, a wicked man. Uh, he has turned his back on the Lord. He has disobeyed the Lord. He has not waited upon the Lord. He has not sought him. And he's been told twice from the prophet Samuel, the Lord has taken the kingdom from you and given it to another who is better than you. And as a youth, um, David has been anointed to be king over Israel as a, as a teenager, as an adolescent, something like that. Uh, David is introduced to the, to the kingdom as that youth, which means under 20. Uh, we don't know how much younger, but a teenager. Uh, as the boy who comes into the camp to uh, provide some food from his brothers and then sees Goliath taunting the armies of God and says, who will stand up for God's people, God's name and his glory? And he, uh, he takes Goliath in battle and kills him. Uh, he is made a part of Saul's community then. He is already an occasional uh, musician for Saul. Becomes a commander and a great warrior in, in Saul's kingdom before jo- Saul's jealousy overwhelms him and David flees uh, from Saul's presence. And uh, men begin to gather to him. So we see here in our text that there are eight, 600 men now with David. And Saul is hunting him to kill him. And this is David's finest hour. I, I googled just last week. How many years was David in the wilderness uh, where Saul hunting him, tried to try to kill him before he became king over Israel? We don't know this exactly. I, some people researched it and I found two websites and one guy said, pretty confident it was eight years. Clicked on another one ten seconds later and a guy said, pretty confident it was about 13 years. So they, they put things together, laid them out and made their, their guesses with certain assumptions. But it's a while, over a decade probably, that David is wandering in the wilderness being sought for his life, people are coming to him, uh, kind of very much a a bit like um, Robin Hood, people who are fleeing the evil rule of Saul who can't pay their taxes and things like that. Um, And so we get to our text and we see David um, here uh, caring for and protecting Israel even though Israel rejects him. Uh, during the dark days of, uh, of World War II, as it began, um, England found itself standing alone against, uh, against Germany in the West. Uh, pushed off the continent, uh, England was in a desperate situation and uh, was expecting an invasion from Germany to come take them out and finish the, uh, the war in the West. And they were down to a, a, a desperate battle in their skies against a, a vastly superior air force that the Germans had. And uh, somehow uh, they won that battle and held off the, uh, the air war. And then as the United States came into the war, the Allies made a plan, England and Canada and the United States, saying, we'll build an army together, we'll supply it, we'll invade Europe. It's going to take over two years, we'll ship it all to England. And so in that time, England mostly uh, developed a tremendous network of, of what you might call counterintelligence, of misinformation to send at the Germans at the cost of many lives and uh, many hundreds or thousands of people working to get information all over the world placed in places that the Germans could pick it up and would filter back to them. So that uh, when Hitler uh, queried his network and said, where will the Allies invade? Uh, I think 199 or one out of about 200 people uh, said Normandy and all the others said Calais, further north. Um, so that's where he was prepared. If, if, if the Germans had known where the Allies would invade, they could have stopped it. 
Even days after the invasion at Normandy, the armored divisions in reserve were held back. They could have swept the Allies into the ocean uh, because they were convinced, and Hitler was convinced, the invasion's coming in Calais, over here. So this is just a diversion. Imagine that your country is at war and you come to a point of uh, conflict at the front lines and you see a little conflict going on over here and you walk up and the local commander is standing there and you say, you think the battle's coming here and you're preparing for that, but they're going to be attacked right here through this cut in the land and if you don't put all your artillery right here, then you'll be rolled over by evening. And if, imagine you had that kind of information and the commander could say, okay, we're, we're ready, we'll do that. And he could know, well, we'll survive today. But he might live, and you leave. <laughs> and he goes, we'll survive today, and we did. But will we survive tomorrow or the next day? I don't know. Uh, but what if you could have that kind of information at your fingertips? Say, we're not only going to win the battle today, we're going to win the war. For the rest of World War II, uh, the Allies were, had the German codes. Uh, they knew what the German orders were, often before the local commanders got their orders to them. It was a tremendous advantage. Uh, it, it was the savings of thousands of Allied lives to the cost of thousands of, um, of German lives. This is a picture, and the life of David here is a picture of the Christian, of, of the Christian life. It's a picture of the spiritual battle. Here in our text, we're going to look at just three things. We see first David acting like a king, uh, even though he's not king over Israel, not yet. And then we see the citizens of Keilah rejecting David, the true king, at least saying, we're not going to follow you, we're not going to keep you, we're not going to be identified with you. Uh, thanks for driving out the Philistines, but now get out of town. And we see third, the invisible hand of God, just visible to us in our text, protecting David from Saul continually protecting David from Saul. Uh, that the real battle is, is an invisible battle that's going on. In our text, we see David finding out about the Philistines. He inquires of the Lord who says, go down. His men hear about it and say, uh, we're terrified to be here in Judah. We don't like being here. We're closer to Saul, uh, but we're terrified of the Philistines. Right? A lot of us aren't fighting men, David. Um, David inquires again of the Lord and says, I've given them to you. Go ahead. Go down. Uh, and so David goes. Uh, he, he, it, we're given the detail. He gets the Philistine cattle. That's, that's good for them. Uh, but there's no indication that they had anything to gain by going down. But the men follow. David inquires once they get there and he strikes a, a heavy blow against the Philistines. Uh, and says, hey, I know Saul's going to come after me. Are, is Kelah going to give me up? Uh, yes, Saul's coming down. Uh, yes, Kilah will give you up. So David gets out of there, and Saul doesn't come down. So the first thing we see in our text is that David is acting like a king, even though Israel doesn't take him as their king. They don't own him, they don't accept him, and they don't want him. But he's still acting like a king. He is their savior, even though they don't want him. <clears throat> Observe a second thing about David. David inquires of the Lord, and then he obeys. He inquires of God three times in our text in this, these short verses. Why is that remarkable? Because most people do not do it. Most people do not inquire of God. What would God have me do? What does God think about this situation? And these situations? Most people don't do that. We don't see Saul inquiring of the Lord. In fact, Saul has killed all of the priests of the Lord. Uh, about 80, 85 of them uh, in an earlier text. Abiathar is the only remaining priest who survived that massacre. He's escaped. He's brought an ephod with him. Uh, Saul wouldn't inquire of the Lord. He has no ability to do so anymore. And when Saul was spoken to by the Lord, go do this, uh, he disobeyed. He did not obey. So Saul takes no, no interest in that. We see the, the contrast between David and Saul. It sounds simple. David seeks God's guidance, then he obeys. It sounds easy. You got a priest? You got an ephod? Let's talk. But it's not easy. It's not common. It's not the way we're built. 
couple of weeks ago, I came into some information, uh, came to my attention that I would never have ordinarily found out, and I was nervous about what I, what, I, what I saw, and I said, perhaps I need to talk to somebody, perhaps I need to inject myself in that situation. Don't want something to go wrong or these people to get into trouble. I mentioned it to my coworker Scott, and over coffee or when we stopped for a sandwich, she, we might have talked for a couple minutes on a Monday and then a couple minutes on a Tuesday. And that was it. And then on like Thursday, he looked at me and said, hey, did you ever talk to anybody about that situation you were nervous about? And I go, no, I prayed about it. And um, I think that's all I'm supposed to do with it. I put the ball in God's court and I feel good. I think that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. But the point is, it took me three days to, to get there. It took me three days to exhaust my thoughts and my process and go, oh, I'm worried about this. Let's pray. I need you to take care of this, God. I want to put this in your hands. Because that's the way I'm wired. That's the way we're all wired. I've noticed something over the years uh, that sounds too simple to be true. But it's very true. I've seen it in my life. And I've seen it and watched it do terrible harm to, uh, to people that I'm close to. And it is this simple fact that when confronted with a decision, even an ordinary decision of life that comes through day by day, um, people, godly people, typically do not consult God. Uh, I have uh, very close friends, uh, deeply, deeply godly Christian people, who lost a a vast sum of money uh, that they could have easily avoided. Um, I have another friend who was convicted of a felony, a serious crime, uh, because he believed what another supposedly Christian businessman uh, told him and then took what he provided for him. It seemed simple. It was convenient. He trusted. Uh, Both of these people had ordinary decisions, but they, they weren't mandatory that they decide on that day. It could have waited days or weeks. But it seemed convenient. It seems good. This is good. These are Christians. Let's go. They didn't say, let me think about this. This is a decent decision. This is a decent bit of money. Um, Let me talk to my buddy, (laughs) who's a a godly woman or a godly man, and think about this. And each of them looked and said, you know, within a day I could have quoted you 16 Proverbs that say, don't do this thing. And it would have connected. I would have read my Bible the next morning and run into something that it would have, if I'd spoken to a friend and prayed about it, say, hey, here's a little decision. It's got a little weight to it. But it looked good, so they went forward. And the costs were overwhelming. What decisions and crises are in your life and in the lives of those you love? Are you inquiring of the Lord? What would you have me do? Where are we to go? Do you know why we don't tend to think more often of inquiring of the Lord about our decisions, about our issues in life? Uh, It's for... Primarily for this one deep reason. Everyone struggles at a deep level with the unspoken fear uh, that the Lord might want something different for them than they want for themselves. So inquiring is dangerous. If you don't want to know the answer, don't ask. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. We all joke about that. What if God says, yes, go attack the Philistines? Oh, uh, I, I was going to ask you something else. Can we go back to that other question? Or he says, yes, move to this city. I want you to go to this city. Um, most of the ordinary, even occasional situations and decisions of life are clearly spoken to in the Word of God. Just, just laid out clearly. On Friday night, I looked at a room of teenagers and I said, you are now making all the decisions for the rest of your life. And they kind of looked at me and go, no, we're not. I said, you've already decided who you're going to marry. No, we haven't. I said, actually, what's important to you, what you value, what you're looking for, uh, studies show you make all those decisions in your teenage, middle to late teenage. You've made all the decisions. So if you marry 10 years from now or 20 years from now, you're usually operating, usually, on the decisions you've made now. So they're important decisions. Maybe the most important decisions long before you meet your spouse, long before you choose your career. You're making decisions about what you value and where your heart lies. And that will, that will be the basis of where you go. <clears throat> if you were to ask me if I've ever heard God speak to me, I would say yes. I don't think it was audible. 
but my most vivid sense of hearing God speak to me was to hear Bible verses just walk through my head. Most of the time, I had read those recently, or I had heard those recently, but I was walking around or thinking about something and going, what do I do about this? Or here's this issue, and how am I supposed to deal with this? Or where do I go? And all of a sudden, the Bible verse I'd heard or read in the last few days walked through my verse, duh, word by word. And I go, oh, well, that's obvious. Sometimes it occurred to me God spoke to me, and other times it just occurred to me I remembered God's word. That's God speaking, right? He's spoken through his word. Oh, if I just thought about your word and remembered what you said, the decision is just obvious. Why am I sweating this? You've made yourself plain to me. If you seek to live by God's revealed will, you will not ultimately be disappointed. David sought God and obeyed what he heard. Obviously, he was willing to obey or he wouldn't have sought him. Kilah is not really appreciative of what David does. I'm sure they're pleased David drove away the Philistines. He saved the harvest. Okay? It's harvest time. They're robbing the threshing floors, we're told. It's a curious little note. It's a great time to raid. Harvest time. I want to hurt the Judeans. I want to take their, their harvest, too. That will really hurt them. Okay? Um, David cared for Kilah. He rescued Kilah when Saul is nowhere to be found. No indication that Saul was planning to come down and save this little town in the south. David is honorable where Saul is not. David is anointed by Samuel to be to the prophet to be king of Israel. And Saul has been told twice, the kingdom is taken from you. Um, so why wouldn't Kilah accept David, follow him, protect him, stand with him? Because the truth is, it's just too costly to be a follower of David. It's too risky. Life is hard. It's short. And if you're going to follow David, it might be very short. <clears throat> God can worry about his plan. Kalah will worry about its own skin. How often do people claim to be Christians and yet walk away from God's people and God's purposes in this world? How often do they walk away? In this city... Most of the time. Most of the time. How many people claiming to be Christians will, will actually give of their time and their talents and their finances to join others in reaching out to people and being to be on mission with Jesus in the city? That's a minority, isn't it? It's a minority. How many teachers and young adults begin to feel that they probably can't trust Jesus with their entire lives. Uh, maybe, Jesus, I need to reserve just this little bit. Just, I probably need to choose my own spouse. Okay, you're Lord of my, I just, and if you want to bring candidates, well, that's all right. I'm willing to look at those. I'd be happy for you to bring candidates for me to consider. Uh, I think I need to choose my profession as well. I might need to choose where I live. Actually, I'm doing really well now. I'll call you when I need you. That's where the conversation goes, even if we don't say the words out loud. We're told in Genesis that Abraham believed God and was justified. He believed, he obeyed, he, he stood on his promises, but he was justified by his faith. In Habakkuk, we hear the ringing truth that the just... Those people who are God's people, he is justified and made right, that just live by faith. They trust in what God has promised, what he will do. They stand on it, even though they haven't seen it yet. In the New Testament, we understand that we are united to Jesus, that we're clothed in his perfect life by faith. And in verse 14, we're told that tall Saul is continually seeking David's life, but God will not let Saul have David. Can you imagine that God would have allowed Kilah to be destroyed by Saul? I don't, I don't know. I, I have a hard time imagining that would happen. So many remarkable things that happen as, as you're reading through the Old Testament. Kilah could have been remembered forever as the first city who stood with David. Who said, you are God's anointed king. Clearly. You are the man of honor. Samuel has anointed you. But they are known throughout history as the city that, that would not accept David, who would not stand with him, who would not live by faith, right? Now pause for a minute and remember with me a couple of important things. 
as we put this, this passage, the, the, this Old Testament section into context. King David is in the Bible uh, for a reason. Because he foreshadows his own greater son. The rest of the Old Testament starts to pick up and say, the son of David. It has to be a son of David. There is a coming son of David. There's a coming son of David actually whose reign will be forever. Who will go over all the nations. There's going to be a son of David. So the life of David is actually here to teach us about Jesus. The greater son of David. Whose kingdom will not end. We're told in the Gospel of John that Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. We find that when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, the twelve disciples scattered. Peter, the uh, spokesman of the twelve, denied Jesus that night three times. I don't know him. We'd like to think that we, if we had just been with Jesus, boy, we wouldn't have these same faith struggles we have, right? No. The apostles had every struggle we have even though they walked with him for three years. Some of my favorite words of Jesus are when he says, Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Famous words. I like those. But not many of us have memorized or or find familiar the the three verses that come right before those words. And they are these. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. We're dependent upon the grace of Jesus to know our Heavenly Father. To come into relationship with the living God. Why is that so important for us to see the common thread between ourselves and the people of Kilah? who did not receive their king. Between those who rejected David, even the twelve apostles, who couldn't stand with him and be identified with him, and ourselves. Because of this one reason. Because we are sinners, which means that, that we have an opposition to God and his purposes at the center of our will. It's bigger than we imagined. It's there, we forget about it, we stop looking at it, and there are no exceptions in any of us. We are deeply oriented to be more impressed with our desires and our will than God's. It's a crisis. What does the recollection of, of these dark truths do for us in the midst of this fine spring weather we're having? I find myself smiling every night just because I'm filled with endorphins. It is, only, it is this. It sets us up for the contrast that is powerful. King David saved Kilah without their asking for help. Even though they would not receive him, David was a king to his subjects before he was their king. Jesus loved you before you loved him. God sent his only son to live the life that he demanded of you that you could not live and to die a death that you deserve so that you might be forgiven for your rebellion, you and me. The reason that sinners like you and me do not despair when we see the depths of our own depravity is that it sets us up for the contrast that is so marvelous. We knew that God loved us, but we didn't recognize he could love a person like me. And he doesn't just love us. He loves us this much. And we couldn't see that until we saw what the contrast was. So if we're shocked by our own depravity, we're shocked further by God's love for us. We said, and we recognize how valuable we are. So we do not feel wretched. For some reason, we feel wonderful. Because Jesus is our focus. It's His attributes. It's His work. It's His righteousness which causes us to stand. Which is actually ours because we're organically united to Him by faith. 
We're clothed in that. God couldn't be any happier with us. As happy as He is with His own Son is how much He delights in His children. That contrast brings us joy. So David acts like a king. He inquires of God and obeys. Kalal rejects the true king to look after their own interests. And finally, we see the invisible hand of God protecting David from Saul. Because David foreshadows his own greater son, Jesus, we learn about Jesus long before he arrived. The good king we did not choose, uh, did not want, uh, did not deserve, but so desperately need. What does Saul symbolize? Saul is rather uh, something of of a Satan figure. The evil ruler of this world seeking to destroy God's appointed Savior. Saul should not be ruling. David should rule. But people don't recognize David as their king. The people serve Saul out of fear. Saul can muster 100,000 troops in a week. What's David got? 600? Most of those aren't really fighting men. I mean, what decision did Kilah have? It's obvious. Or is it? Verse 14 pulls back the curtain and shows us the hand of God. Saul sought David every day. Saul had one purpose in his life, to secure his own kingdom by killing David, of whom he was jealous. But God did not give David into Saul's hand. Saul even thinks that God has done something for him when he hears that he's at Kelah. Oh, God has given him into my hand. Because obviously as king, anything I want is what God wants and what God gives me, right? Saul doesn't inquire. That's just the way he thinks in his pride. If God has a plan, and he does, then no one can thwart him. It may look dark. It may look like his plans are succeeding. But all his plans do succeed. Let's lay out the picture. David is, is hiding. He's moving with all of these men. Uh, previous, we hear a number of 400, and now, in the next text, we now, it's four, 600 men. It's growing. Do they have families with them back in the wilderness that are being fed? How do I care for these people, David must say. Where do I get the food? How do I hide this many people in the wilderness? Surely we will be discovered by the agents of Saul. <clears throat> Why did evil king Saul rule for so long? What was it like in that period for over a decade to live in Israel under an evil king? Um, I don't know. Why did God do it? He has his purposes. We could see some value. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways higher than ours. Think about all the people who lived and died before David even became king. Before the golden age of Israel began. They never got to see it. Imagine a dying man lying on his deathbed in this period of time, in the interim period here, when Saul is seeking David's life. He's on his deathbed. Today is his last day. His family has assembled around him. Children and grandchildren. And he looks at his family and says, See here, as long as I've been head of this family, this family stood with King Saul. Saul is still in power. It's gone well for us. You wouldn't want to have backed the wrong horse now, would you? What if one of the grandchildren stepped forward and said, Well, grandfather, if it's true that we're eternal beings and will stand in judgment one day before a holy God who is just and who will punish every wrong, perhaps it's of ultimate greater value eternally For us to stand with the good king that God has provided, instead temporarily with the evil king who is in charge. Maybe the right side was always obvious in hindsight, grandfather. David bled for us. Saul made us bleed for him. We know that Samuel anointed David king and has proclaimed that the kingdom is torn from Saul. Isn't it a small thing, perhaps, that if we were to stand for David, we might have lost our land. Maybe we would have, some of us would have lost our lives. But perhaps in the light of eternity, which you will enter today, grandfather, 
and we will enter shortly behind you. Perhaps it would have been a better thing to stand with God's purposes, even though they could have been costly. That'd be a remarkable 15-year-old, wouldn't it? But we know those 15-year-olds have come. They do come. When we read the life of David and the history of God's plan of redemption from, from before creation, we recognize again that our circumstances are never a measure of God's love for us, are they? These desperate years in the wilderness are David's finest hour. When he becomes the celebrated figure, the savior of Israel, the great and golden king, a man whose heart is with God and for God, and who will do what God commands, no matter what it costs him. No matter what he could gain, he'll be God's man. <clears throat> Has life been difficult, or painful, or disappointing? So it was for Jesus. So it was for David. And for God's people much of the time. That which is worthwhile is never easy, and that which is not, and that is not simply the life we are given. It's also the life to which we're called. And Jesus didn't say, Come to me and I'll make your life easy. He said, I'll give you rest, I'll give you work with me, but that work will be a delight, but it will be a job. Jesus said that to follow him was to walk to our own executions. He used a brutal image. If you want to follow me, you have to carry a cross. Uh, the most disturbing con uh, form of execution ever invented. He said that to follow him was to lose our lives. And that if we sought to save our lives, we would lose them. But if we lost them for his sake, we would find them. The truth is that everyone loses their life for someone or something. Everyone loses their life for someone or something. We just don't recognize it. The question simply remains was, was it worth it? Shouldn't we be asking that of our grandparents? What did you put your life on? What did you put it all on? Who did you put it all on or what? Was it worth it? I need some advice here while you're still with me. Was it worth it? Or even our friends and co-travelers. What did you put your life on? What are you settling the whole thing on? How's that going for you? Hear the words of Jesus again from Matthew eleven twenty-eight. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are humbled before a God who loves us and loves us even though we put you aside. We reject who you are and what you've done for us. And you continue to love us until one day by your grace we look up and we see the truth. Grant that we may revel in your love for us this day. That we may be a people of freedom free to see our own patterns and decisions, free to lay them at your feet and to walk by faith because we know that you love us and that you will make all things work together for our good, for the good of your kingdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.